The political intrigue of 23 BC saw not only the near-fatal illness of Augustus Caesar and sudden death of his nephew Marcellus, but also the fortuitous exchange of Parthia's kidnapped prince for Rome's lost standards and citizens, as well as the questionable outcome of the trial of Marcus Primus. But quietly brewing beneath it all was a more sinister event in the making. Not long before the princeps Civitatus left the city to tour the eastern provinces, a plot was born to assassinate Caesar Augustus. By the beginning of 23 BC, Caesar Augustus had secured the office of consul eleven times, with nine consulships held consecutively from 31 to 23 BC. Not only did he personally monopolize the office of consul, but his friends and supporters also enjoyed multiple co-consulships, with Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa holding the office three times and Titus Statilius Taurus named Caesar's co-consul twice. Besides dominating Rome's top governmental offices, Caesar Augustus had elevated his personal disputes to become matters of state, while simultaneously appropriating the province of Egypt as if it were his own personal property. He was even accused of disregarding the law by surreptitiously interfering with the Senate's public provinces in order to maintain a state of war on the frontiers. He also seized the credit for triumphal honors by sharing the title of Imperator with each and every one of Rome's triumphing generals. While blocking some from receiving military glory, Caesar Augustus used his position to fast-track his family members up the Cursus Honorum, naming his steps in Tiberius as Quester and his nephew Marcellus as Aedile, all the while funding the construction of royal edifices, a palace on the Palatine, a theatre to be dedicated to Marcellus, and the enormous mausoleum of the Julii. It was becoming more and more obvious to the dwindling body of Rome's senatorial elite as well as to many equities, that the constitutional settlement of 27 BC had failed to restore the Republic and had merely hidden Caesar Augustus's tyrannical agenda behind Republican traditions. It was an equite member of Caesar's inner circle, Terentius Varro Murina, and a senatorial aristocrat named Fannius Caepio, possibly a descendant of the Caepio alleged to have stolen the famed gold of Tolosa in 106 BC, who now came together. The timing of this plot is still heavily debated among scholars, with some sources placing it as late as 22 BC and others placing it at the beginning of 23 BC, before Caesar Augustus fell ill. If this conspiracy was materializing near the end of 23 BC, Licinius Terentius Varro Murina may have been co-consul for the year, explaining his outrage over Caesar Augustus' intrusion into his trial against Marcus Primus, and why he may have treated the princeps so disrespectfully upon cross-examination. It is also possible that the plot took place early in the year, the result of Varro Murina's realization that his consulship alongside Caesar Augustus was little more than a toothless title bearing little to no say in the governance of Rome. A third possibility is that the consul of 23 BC was one Aulus Terentius Varro Murina, a relative of the Terentius Varro Murina who cross-examined Caesar Augustus. Historical details surrounding this plot are sparse, and fraught with inconsistent names and dates among various sources. But we are told that a plebeian nobleman by the name of Castricius uncovered the plot and revealed it to Caesar Augustus, who in turn discussed the plot and its resolution with his closest intimates. One of those intimates was Augustus' propagandist Gaius Mycenas. Mycenas then shared Augustus' knowledge of the plot with his wife, Terentia, who wasted no time in warning her brother, Varro Murina, that he was in immediate danger. And so, by the time they were called to trial to be prosecuted by Caesar's stepson, Tiberius, Varro Murina and Fannius Caepio were already fleeing Rome. Although it was illegal to try a Roman citizen in his absence, denying him his right to legal defense, the trial commenced, even with the defendants in absentia. A number of jurors voted to acquit Varro Murina and Fannius Caepio, likely as a protest against the illegal prosecution, but the majority voted to convict. We are told that Varro Murina's brother, Gaius Proculus, 
who had captured Cleopatra and earned the favor of Caesar Augustus, joined Gaius Mycenaeus, who was Varro Murina's brother-in-law, in begging for mercy on behalf of the defendants, but their pleas fell on deaf ears. As a result of the trial, Varro Murina and Fannius Caepio were both hunted down and executed. However, when Augustus approved the Senate's vote to offer sacrifices in honor of his glorious victory over the assassination plot, the princeps civitatus' popularity began to falter. The Roman people did not find the execution of citizens a thing to be celebrated before the gods. Now aware that the people found his self-admiration detestable, it seems likely that Caesar Augustus also realized that the senatorial aristocracy have reached its breaking point over his singular control of the Roman state. With two known plots against him already foiled, how long would it be before one succeeded, and Caesar Augustus found his own fate mirroring the sad and brutal death of his adoptive father? A second constitutional settlement was soon negotiated between Caesar Augustus and the Roman Senate. In his capacity as consul, and likely as a concession to those who felt it had been inappropriate to try Roman citizens in absentia, Caesar Augustus passed new legislation requiring all votes cast during in absentia trials be made public, with the additional condition that the votes be unanimous in the event of a guilty verdict. To deflect criticism that he had monopolized Rome's consular office, the princeps civitatus journeyed to the Alban Mount, where he ritually resigned the post for the remainder of the 23 BC year. To take his place, as another accommodation of the senatorial aristocracy, he nominated Lucius Cestius Albanianus Quirinalis, a well-known senator whose support of the liberators, Brutus and Cassius, was such that he had fought with them at almost every battle, including Philippi, and even twenty years after their deaths still displayed statues of Marcus Junius Brutus on his properties as a symbol of freedom against tyranny. As a replacement for the deceased consul Varro Murina, Caesar appointed Nius Calpurnius Piso, another member of the senatorial elite who opposed the party of Caesar Augustus. Beyond these changes, before laying down his consulship, Caesar also raised the number of praetors elected each year from the standard eight to ten, employing the two new praetors as overseers of Rome's finances. Following his war against the Cantabrians, which came to a close in 24 BC, Caesar Augustus divided Hispania into two provinces, whereupon he returned the more peaceful of the provinces back to the Senate. Caesar also returned the island of Cyprus to the Senate in 23 BC, along with the province of Gallia Narbonensis, as these provinces no longer required his military attention. In exchange for these compromises, the Senate offered Caesar Augustus a lifelong term as Tribune of the Plebs, offering him its power of veto and its power to legislate on behalf of the Roman Plebs. Caesar, however, refused to accept the office of Tribune of the Plebs, but did accept the power of the Tribunate, known as the Tribunitia Potesta. With this newly created office, Caesar could hold all the powers of the Tribunate, while all ten seats remained open to future candidates in the yearly elections. In consideration of the fact that Caesar Augustus had been given the right to speak first during Senate meetings, a right that did not accompany his new station as Tribune, the Senate also offered him the Imperium Proconsulare Maius. Aside from retaining his honor as first speaker, he was also permitted to uphold the office of Proconsul and its Imperium for the rest of his life. With the Imperium Proconsulare Maius, Caesar Augustus no longer had to lay down or reinstate his Proconsular Imperium upon crossing the Pomerium as he entered or exited the city. This office also granted Caesar Augustus the authority to call the Senate to order whenever he desired and to determine the Senate's agenda at will, even if he was not consul in that year. The Maius Imperium Proconsulare further gave Augustus authority over Rome's provincial governors, making them accountable to him even in their own provinces. Yet another offer presented to the princeps civitatus by the Senate was a lifelong term as Roman censor. This office conferred control over who could and could not sit within the Senate, 
as well as conferring the authority to define the moral laws which must be obeyed by the Roman people. Caesar Augustus refused the Senate's offer of the censorship, granting it instead to Paulus Aemilius Lepidus. Paulus was a nephew of the former triumvir Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, and was the husband of Caesar Augustus' one-time stepdaughter, Cornelia, daughter of Scribonia. Paulus was given the censorship for a standard lustrum, or five-year term, to be served jointly with Lucius Munatius Plancus, the man who had betrayed the contents of Mark Antony's last will and testament to Caesar Augustus in 32 BC. Now with his right-hand man, Marcus Agrippa, returning to Rome, preparing to marry his daughter Julia, Caesar Augustus made plans to leave the city. He would first journey to Sicily, and from there continue on to Rome's eastern provinces. After touring and inspecting his legions, he would meet with King Phraates at the Euphrates River, where he would receive Rome's lost military standards and what remained of her prisoners of war. But it seems likely that Caesar left the city with some trepidation. For the first time since the defeat of Marcus Antonius, the very man who had vehemently accused Caesar of preventing the restoration of the Republic, Caesar Augustus was no longer in absolute power. The tide of republicanism was turning. Rome would, once again, be under the control of the senatorial aristocracy.